we'd like to begin by welcoming all of you to our four evenings discussion. My name is Maya Konitzer and I'm with the Global Studies Center at the, at the University of Pittsburgh. The discussion is scheduled in partnership with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures 10 evenings and our thanks go out to them for their continuing support. And I know Stephanie is with us this evening. So thank you, Stephanie, for joining us. We would also like to extend our thanks to our colleagues at the European Studies Center at Pitt, who are the co-sponsors of this discussion. These pre-lecture discussions that are scheduled prior to author events with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures provide hopefully additional insight on prominent writers and engaging issues. So tonight we will be discussing the work of Bernardine Evaristo entitled Girl, Woman, and Girl, Woman, Other. I'm delighted to welcome all of you once again and to introduce our speaker who will lead this discussion. So Anu or Anupama Jain, PhD, is the executive director of Pittsburgh's Gender Equity Commission in the mayor's office. Anu is also the founder of Inclusant, which is a consulting firm focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion that uses applied research and evidence-based strategies to offer cross-sector training. Since 2014, Inclusant has designed customized interventions for over 80 organizations in the greater Pittsburgh region. A full-time professor of literary and cultural studies for over a decade, Anu taught courses on subjects such as utopian studies, post-colonial writing, and literary theory. She's the author of How to be South Asian in America, Narratives of Ambivalence and Belonging, published by Temple University Press, which investigates how the American dream shapes the national imaginary and influences public policy. And with uh, no further ado, please, Anu, take it over. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I miss talking about literature, so I'm thrilled to be here uh, and see some familiar faces and some new names and faces. Uh, and so thanks for, for having me. And uh, we'll start off with some just some comments uh, to help um, us all think about some things together and then a chance to talk to each other. Uh, and share our insights and, and what we loved about the reading experience. Um, and this book has just been such a joy for me. So I wanted to talk about, uh, I always start in my, when I used to teach literature, I always started with the title. Um, and so I always think about, well, now that I'm done, what, what does it mean to me? What did I expect? Um, and to get at the title, I actually found myself thinking about the word diaspora. And diaspora is simply put just means people who start from one uh, shared place uh, or space and uh, are, end up dispersed widely. Um, and it's been used in classic terms uh, to talk about um, Armenian uh, in more contemporary ways, talk about Chinese diaspora, uh, for instance, as groups of people in different historical moments um, have, have taken their cultural connections uh, to one place and imagine differently elsewhere. And this book is, is a diaspora of characters and their lives intersect even as they're crossing continents, they're exploring relationships and they're exploring their own diverse identities um, with each other and uh, over time. And what connects them is a mutual reckoning with what does it mean to be a girl or a woman or to say I'm not a girl or a woman, even though that may have been uh, how other people saw you. Um, and it's also reckoning with blackness, with black joy, with power, with solidarity, with creativity, pain, historical narratives that really didn't allow enough space for the kind of uh, identity exploration that we see. And the Third part of the title, Girl, Woman, Other, uh, really made me think about othering as a process, as a social psychological experience. Um, and the term other, if we just think about any individual, anyone who is not me is 
othered to me. <laughs> that's psycho psychology, self and other. That's one of the, the major ways that we organize our experiences in the world. Um, between groups of people, other, and I'm sort of imagining capital O, other, is someone who's foreign, uh, someone who's an outsider, often someone who's a threat, the other who looms, who is a shadow. Um, and this is connected in our in countries and the institutions that represent them uh, and the, what we claim are our cultures. There's a, a process of othering, of making people consistently feel you don't really belong here. You are not a part of my community, imagined or otherwise. Um, and it leaves people feeling um, perpetually like outsiders, even if they're at home, uh, you know, where their home is. Uh, and for a moment, I'll just uh, mention that recently we've seen a lot of attention um, to anti-Asian racism in this country. Uh, and Asians have been in America for centuries, uh, but there are fifth and sixth generation Chinese and Japanese Americans in particular, who are repeatedly othered, um, who are told to go back home, go back where you come from, who are exoticized um, and harmed. And so, so all of these things, I think, they go to deep to the core of the human experience of, of navigating the world, figuring out who I am, where do I belong, who is like me, who's not like me. But it can also lead to extreme situations um, as we know of violence, but uh, psychologically for individual people trying to figure out and answer that, that central question, who am I? Um, it can lead to a lot of exclusion, marginalization, dehumanization. Um, and th there are instances throughout this book of othering, um, people imposing certain expectations on others uh, that, you know, who are, expected to assimilate uh, to certain ideas. There's violence done to people's bodies uh, and minds and lives um, in an in a effort to dominate. Um, and there's also feeling invisible, um, even to those who should recognize us the most. And so I think that there is something uh, to, to be unearthed here a lot of people will suggest that it's human nature, that difference makes us scared, that it is a threat. Um, there's, not, there's not that much evidence that I find compelling. Um, there are certainly historical examples of how people have treated the other this way. Um, but I think this book really invites uh, readers to disregard prejudice and stereotypes. Uh, the authors call this fusion fiction. Um, readers have called it polyphonic. Uh, it's a poetic set of stories. The characters are imperfect, very human, but they're compelling. They're at times inspiring, at times heartbreaking, at times just annoying. Yes, <laughs> the opening chapter is about yes. Um, but they're all seeking belonging and self-knowledge and they're confronting those barriers um, created by othering. And I just wanted to name the characters for a second, because I, I do feel like they're so rich uh, and that their stories are gonna stay with me. But we have at the center of the book, of course, is Ama, and everyone uh, is connected through the after party for her surprising hit play. She's finally made it mainstream uh, in later decades um, after being a, a radical uh, playwright. Um, and we have Morgan, who's reviewing the play, Yaz, who's Ama's daughter, Dominique is her art. I have to look at a list of the names because there are a lot. <laughs> I'll leave one out. Her artistic partner, best friend. And then we have Shirley, who is uh, Ama's very different uh, childhood friend. Um, and she uh, taught Carol. Um, and we start to branch out even further here because Carol uh, is, we hear her mother's story, Boomi's story, we hear Penelope's story, who's a colleague of Shirley's. Um, and then we branch further out, Letitia, who is a childhood friend of Carol's. Um, and then things come full circle when we realize is Gracie's daughter, Hattie, is unexpectedly connected to both Penelope 
and to Morgan. And we finally get, uh, not finally, but we also have this sort of winsome. So there are a lot of mothers in this um, and lots of deep, painful relationships as well as I'll just circle back to, to Joy. And I think that this sharing this reading experience and talking about this book gives us a chance to build a community here for a moment, for an hour, uh, and really get to know each other so that that, that sense of threat or foreignness, um, we see that uh, as um, perhaps more exaggerated than uh, the pleasure of, of hearing from each other. So um, we wanted to um, have you break up. And I will let the wonderful folks, Veronica and Maya and Yunju, who are helping with the tech behind the scenes, um, if you could break the group, um, break the big group up into smaller groups. And then we're, we just have a few questions to get you started thinking about what you, what you took away from this book, what it meant for you. Um, and I can post, uh, paste the questions in the chat, Maya. Unless, okay, I'll do that right now. And um, so I just, working on working I just happy. posted the questions in the chat and I am asking my colleagues um, to bring them with them into the discussion, into the breakout room. So everybody can discuss the same questions and we're gonna take about 15 minutes. So I'll let you know when we're about two minutes uh, before 6.30, call you back to, and then we'll come back as a whole group to discuss further. So thank you all. All right, so we're all back. You're welcome back to the group. Um, and I wondered while hopefully everyone's getting back and settled into being back in the main room, did anyone want to share something uh, that came up in your group that uh, you know, was a new idea for you or seemed to be really something you shared with the other people here as a response to the book. I'm so used to classroom teaching. <laughs> I haven't been doing much teaching in the last couple of years, so I'm like scanning your faces, but you can't really tell. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, really I, and there's no pressure, but if anybody wants to share something from your breakout group, please. Stephanie raised something really interesting right at the end. In our Michael, group. maybe turn to talk, but I can't hear him. Can other people hear him? It's not working. We can hear him, Anu, can you? Okay, well, let me- Is it me? <laughs> yes, I think. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll send you a chat anew after I make the comment, but you can't hear me say that, so it doesn't matter. Um, I just wanted to lift up Stephanie's question at the end of our group that we didn't really fully get to discuss, which I thought was a really interesting one about the radicalness of the book, um, that Evaristo describes herself uh, as, a, as a radical writer, uh, as a radical feminist, and uh, what people thought about that and how that came across and what it means for a book like this to be reaching such a wide audience. So. Um, I don't know, I thought it was a great question and we didn't really have time to, to dig into it. So I'm just gonna take the liberty of raising it again. Somebody wanna jump in because I missed what Michael said because somehow my audio went away for a second and I apologize. Um, so we wanna pick it up from where he left off and I'll catch up as fast as I can. Um, I can jump in just so I can say it instead of Michael having to repeat it. Um, in our group, I um, mentioned that um, I'd overheard you saying that some folks had watched different videos when she, some of the videos in response to the booker, she talked about being a radical writer and seeing herself as a radical feminist and how with this book and winning the booker, the book has been so widely read and she's been surprised to learn that so many um white men who don't think of themselves as having radical politics have read the book, um, people in general, but especially white men, it really struck her and how much they liked it and how much they felt um, compassion and understanding of, of the women. So kind of the question of 
you know, is it a radical gesture for then a, a book like this to get read so widely? And how does that, you know, what impact does that have? I am going to make a radical choice, which hopefully Maya will be nodding at me in a second. And there, so one of the questions that I had for us to talk about is, why do you think the book has been so highly praised? And I was talking to someone who read it and they said, oh, it's your first book. I said, no, <laughs> not at all. This is someone with a long career. Now, admittedly, in, you know, uh, it, the recognition of the writer um, in our country is different than, than in the UK. On the other hand, this is really exploded on the scene. The Booker, of course, helps. The quote unquote controversy of the Booker being given to two people. And I could go on and on about Booker prizes. I, I have thought a lot about them and what, what they mean in the world. But it's definitely brought a lot of attention. And so why, um, what do you think, A, I think the question that it sounds like uh, the group discussed, thank you, Michael and Stephanie, about is this book not radical if it can appeal to so many people or what does it mean that it's had, had this broad appeal? I, and why do you think that is? Because it's true, um, white men and a diverse cast of girl, women, other characters, you wouldn't immediately say there's a lot of relatability there, right? That wouldn't necessarily be your guess. And, and feel free to just unmute yourself and, and pop out ideas. Um, if you have thoughts, like, and, and some of the questions from the beginning were meant to get at why did you potentially love it or engage with it? Yeah, Kathy, go for it. Okay. Well, I, I would respond to that by, you know, again, I, I think I'm the outlier here in the group living in South Dakota. We don't have, you know, our biggest minority here is Native folks. And, um, you know, this book opens, you know, we get to, you know, like I said, in the small group, go inside the, you know, see inside the mind of these people that we may not ordinarily rub elbows with or get to know or, you know, understand even an eighth of what they're going through. And she just shines such a great light on that. That's just my thought. Thank you. Jump on in. Anyone want to add to that or have an adjacent thought or a different thought? So, yeah, Brian. So as a white man, I guess, a white male. So first place, it was just a good book. I mean, you know, take away, you know, how you want to characterize it, where you're going to put it. I loved reading the book. I like the characters. Yeah, we talked in our session about the, the, the oddities of the way she wrote and the challenges, but also good parts. But there were parts in there, you know, like I remember, um, so I'm from a very, you know, an ethnic uh, Pittsburgh family, right? We, I have an Anglo Anglicanized last name because that's what my grandfather did in, you know, 1915 when he came from Eastern Europe here. And, you know, and, and you know, we're, we're, for instance, we're Eastern Orthodox. So this isn't our Easter this weekend, we celebrate Old Calendar, our Easter is May 2nd, so we're two weeks into Lent and so forth. But when Carol goes home and her mother, you know, cooks what had been her favorite food, this, you know, her, her uh, you know, a native dish, I can't remember exactly what it was. And her mom was so proud, I mean, so proud of her and what she'd accomplished at Oxford. And then, you know, her... I don't know, it was like her, her gift to her, her reward or whatever her mother was to cook what had been this woman's favorite dish. Yeah. And she didn't want to eat it anymore because it didn't fit into the, her new, the new context of her life and who, who she was becoming and, and, and her friends and her, you know, whatever. And, you know, I think about, um, you know, uh, stories in, in my own family's history about that. Like, you know, as we you know, my, my grandparents came here and then my parents were born here. So I'm, you know, second generation born and how, you know, I had an uncle that um, changed his first name because it sounded too ethnic, you know, he didn't want that. And, um, you know, uh, stories of, of the, you know, my uncles who in the 50s and 60s would come home and they couldn't stand the food that their, my baba was cooking for them. You know, the things that we fight over now, like pierogies and holishki and, you know, and things like that. And, I'm like, wow, you know, there's a very um, similar um, experience there. I mean, you know, here's a, an African-Caribbean Black woman in, in Great Britain. Um, her, her, that sort of immigrant um, experience coming here and becoming, you know, British, as, you know, many families here came from somewhere, 
and became American. Um, you know, I mean, in my family, we still talk about December 25th as American Christmas, you know, and, and this Sunday is American Easter. Um, you know, yet we've been here for a hundred years and, 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 and that, so I do think there were places that were related it, um, in, but in different ways, at least for me, when I read this book. Yeah, thank you. And, and I, this idea has, has often occurred to me about to get at the universal human experiences, we actually need all the details, the texture, the nuance, that even though the experience might not match my own, by being able, as, as someone in my group said, to inhabit the sort of the mind, the, the life of one of these characters and, that, and that, that they're so so vivid, so fleshed out that there is a way, even if it's not my shared specific experience, there's a way in which it, it, uh, it resonates. Uh, did other people have thoughts about this? I, I think it is, it's absolutely, literature is political, it's an industry, there are all, you know, capitalist imperatives, all of these things happening and circulating. And so I think there are lots of good books that probably don't get published, and there may be some not so great books that get published, but but what what in this moment, this book seems to have really spoken to audiences. Now, first of all, I got highlighted for them and got a lot of attention. And then the author charms everyone with her interviews because just like, <laughs> lovely, wonderful, you know, kind person. Um, but do other people, did, they, did you have thoughts about maybe why this, it's, it's not an expected book maybe to become a, a coffee table favorite uh, for all sorts of people. I thought of immediately when Stephanie raised the question um, was this quote, and I think it's usually, I know you may know the answer to this. I feel like Sharice Cramoray is the person I'm thinking of, a, a feminist author from a while back. Anyway, she gave my favorite ever definition of feminism, which was that feminism is the radical idea that women are humans. <laughs> and what's great about that quote is that it's both utterly obvious and unradical and also historically and politically quite radical, right? And what I feel like was effective about this book is that the way in which the book is radical is in just presenting girls, women, other as human in such a relatable way, right? In the way that Brian was sharing, right? That just yeah. independent of anything else, it's just a book we can relate to. And so that to me, is the radicality of the book, right? Because it makes people who are very different from many of the readers who will come to the book have a human connection with people mm -hmm. who are, are very different from them. And, and, and that to me is really radical. I think, it, I think that part of what's happening here is that uh, stories are coming to life for uh, for some of us as readers so so I'll just say first of all I know all sorts of people who are like the people in the book so there and I know some of them are in the UK but uh, you know and, and I come from a diasporic family and I have family in all sorts of countries and things like that so in fact I related to a lot of these characters that was like oh my god that reminds me of someone so I had a, a bit of a different reading experience in that sense um but I do think that <laughs> Uh, stories like Boomi's story or the other immigrant women, the women who clean um, in our societies, these are not usually elevated to the level of literary material, right? Mm -hmm. And and in fact, literature, the idea of writing stories about people who were poor, who were the servants, that was not traditionally considered something that we'd want to hear about. It was the heroic, but these are people who are heroic, but we get to know that they're heroic because we need to know the details, right? The choices they make, you know, Carol becoming who Carol becomes because we know as almost no one else does in her life, um, what she's been through, the tragedy and the hardship. And that 
it's not a glamorous life to be a cleaner, but you know, maybe like me, you felt like, um, you know, the characters who go from having very few options and being exploited and often by men, but also just by other people and being able to, to really craft lives um, of their own choosing. And so, so I think there is a, there's a piece of that, that these, the, this is a moment in which internationally, a lot of people are getting stories that they might not typically think this is Britain, but this is Britain, right? I too am. Oxford, I don't know if you all remember that, like many institutions of higher ed, students um, of color um, and students from LGBTQ plus communities um, have started campaigns to just say, it's, we're not what you think we are. We are, we are not the stereotype of this country. Um, and we make this country work like every country, right? It is the, the people whose stories we want to see. So anyway, I, I went up along than I went. I want to make sure if other folks, um, we have another breakout uh, and I have a couple of, I pulled out some quotes in the book that I thought were really interesting um, and then figured even if you haven't gotten to that part of the book, you know, you can talk about the language, but do, do folks have other, I can talk about literature like, you know, all day, every day. <laughs> so I love my 45 minute discussions of that one sentence in a book in my classes. Uh, but let me open it up again for thoughts that folks are having. Or, and the quotes are, the citations that I picked are in the chat. Um, and I have to admit the first one, I'm gonna be 50 in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really, really hitting home for me. Um, and I do think it's not for all of us. I mean, human, our experience, as, as far as we know, we die. We're born, we die. And part of that is we age. Um, but there's also gender ways in which how women age. Um, if you can't tell my hair has died, it's mostly white. My, my mother doesn't want me to not dye my hair because then everyone will know that she's because if her daughter has gray hair, gray white hair, then she must, you know, whatever. Um, and so this is this is actually seriously the biggest fight I've had with my mother. I'm nearly 50, as I said. Um, but aging is nothing to be ashamed of, especially when the he entire human race is in it together. Although it seems, sometimes it seems that Ama alone among her friends wants to celebrate getting older because it's such a privilege not to not die prematurely. And, and one of the things also about this book, the humor, um, I do think there's lots of different moments that are, I don't know if I would call them laugh aloud, loud, funny, but, but there is a, there's, yeah, I don't, maybe I won't say more. I'm not even sure I know the words, but this, this quote struck me for personal reasons, my own aging journey um, and, and the universality of it. But, you know, because it's such a privilege to not die prematurely. Um, dark humor, maybe. <laughs> to, and, and I, uh, I wanted to start you off with that and just tell you a little bit about what I was thinking, but each of these is just invites some thinking and if you want to talk about the characters and maybe we could do some more breakouts for 10 minutes. What do you think? And then I have it ready to go so I can do that right away. Because yeah, let's do that. And then we'll just we'll wrap up with some things and I'll, I'll give folks my contact. And if you were like, I really want to keep talking about that book, you should reach out to me later. <laughs> All right. So Anu, if you're with us, if you'd like to continue or conclude. Yes, I mean, we. this hour has passed. I have appreciated getting to know some of you a little bit um, and just a chance to I just love diving into a book and, and people have taught me so many different ways to think about this that part of me wants to rush back and reread it. Um, and if work will allow, but I just, uh, I think that the pleasure so many different types of people have taken in this book and that so many of you have shared the things you like, um, there is a power to that. I think that there uh, is a strong sense of uh, there's really quick evolution 
um, of some of our cultural norms, especially around gender, um, that younger people are really very overtly saying, yeah, I, I don't care about those conventions that are that are important to some older people. Um, and so so we're in a moment, I think, of, of uh, cultural transition. And, 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 and this has happened, you know, it, at the turn of the 20th century in the US, um, the idea of the new woman um, really was shaking people up. You know, women are going to work outside the house and they're not going to care for their families and it's going to be the demise of the of everything we know. <laughs> and so th there are definitely these, these crunch points and I think social media is, is becoming, um, becoming a, a way that we're changing this. I think the more we talk to each other about things uh, like, you know, the stories of girl, woman, other, the more that we can carve out uh, attention and time to, to engage and, and learn how rich these stories are. Uh, I think the more that we can, we can weather this <laughs> rather than feeling alone or scared or threatened by, by what are really just creative, wonderful, uh, rich ways of, of experiencing the world. And I would like in just, I, I know we're almost over, but Stephanie, can you share some exciting news with us? Yes, I would love to. Um, so I know it's very last minute. Um, Bernardine Evaristo is scheduled for 10 o'clock on Monday to meet with Pitt students from the Honors College. And because of some transition that's been happening in the Honors College lately, um, and I think this, you know all of the challenges before all of you at Pitt, um, we have very few students attending. So I wanted to let you all know that I would love for you to join us on the Zoom call. So again, it's 10 o'clock on Monday. It's a one hour Zoom call. Basically the questions that we've asked today, we can ask to Bernadine, which is just incredible. Yes, I see Anu is smiling herself silly over there. <laughs> Sorry, um, I am too. I mean, I just, she is just so lovely. I already I had the um, honor of already seeing her video and being able to ask her some questions for the Q&A and I did not wanna let her go. Um, so anyway, I would just say, turn it back to Maya to say that, um, I guess Maya, you had in, um, emailed everyone initially and maybe yeah. you can- they So can... if you'd like to share that link with me, I will make sure well, that- Well, actually I'm gonna put it the other way. So if you want to come, email Maya, and then we will get the link to you so that we know who's coming. All right, and here, I'll put my email, I'll put two emails in there, but the reminder email that you received, uh, feel free to use that to email. So either my email or our center email, which I just put in um, chat. And I also see some people had to leave early. So if you wouldn't mind extending that to everybody who was on Absolutely. the call. Um, we that. would love to have you and it will just be a Q&A. Wonderful. And just before everybody goes, I do want to first thank Anu for being with us tonight uh, and for sharing your, your wonderful expertise. And I do want to ask one quick question uh, as we're planning our fall events. If you could just raise either your virtual or your physical hand. Uh, tell us if you'd prefer to have these type of discussions in person, if that would be an option in the fall, or would you prefer, so let's do this. Would you prefer to continue having Would you prefer to have virtual discussions in the fall? Please raise your hand if that's a yes. Can you move your hand in the middle of the screen, camera? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. That gives us an idea. So we'll just c continue asking participants as we move forward for the rest of the semester, just to get an idea how we can uh, do this again in the fall. So thank you all. Uh, this was wonderful. And we wish you everybody a, a pleasant evening. And this, is, this concludes our four evenings. Uh, for the academic year and we hope to be back in touch uh, next year and we hope you will join us then.